Hi, I'm Jack, and in this video, we'll be taking a closer look at how things spin. We'll be doing an experiment with this turntable and these two 10-pound weights. In configuration A, we'll put both plates at the center of the turntable. Then, in configuration B, we'll put the plates on the edges of the table. Now, make a prediction. Which system will stop first? We're assuming that both systems start with the same speed, and both systems have the same total mass. The only difference is how the masses are distributed. Pause the video now and make a prediction. All right, here we go. Congratulations if you predicted that system A would stop first. Now let's dive into the physics to understand why. The key idea we need to understand this experiment is something called the moment of inertia. And if you've ever handled a golf club, or a hammer, or a tennis racket, you've probably noticed that it's easier to rotate the object when holding it near its center of gravity. For example, beginning tennis players often choke their racket, holding it close to the racket head instead of at the grip. Even though you're rotating the same mass, it is harder to rotate when holding the object at the end than at the center. Notice that the amount of torque required to rotate an object, or more accurately cause an angular acceleration, depends on how the mass is distributed around the axis of rotation. The quantity that relates torque and angular acceleration is called the moment of inertia, and it's analogous to mass for linear dynamics. For an object only undergoing rotational motion, we can derive a law analogous to Newton's second law from the definitions of torque and angular acceleration. The details are here, um, and you can pause the video to figure it out, but the important thing is that we actually have two factors of r. One is from the torque, and the other one is from the angular acceleration. And the moment of inertia is this integral the integral over all points on the body um, of r squared times dm. And once again, the details of the calculations are here for a homogeneous disk, uh, but the final result is just that the moment of inertia for a homogeneous disk rotating about its axis of symmetry is a half mr squared. And for a glass turntable with a mass of 13.9 kilograms, a radius of 0.35 meters, uh, that works out to 0.851 kilogram meters squared when rotating around its axis of symmetry. But what happens when the axis of symmetry is no longer the axis of rotation, as in when I move the plates to the edge of the table in configuration B? Well, luckily we have something called the parallel axis theorem that helps us really easily calculate the new moment of inertia. Let's take a look at what happens when I move this plate from the center of the turntable to the edge. As this goes around the turntable, the center of mass makes a trip with this radius, but also take a look at what happens to this pink point as it travels around the table uh, relative to the center of mass of the plate. As this rotates, this point is also rotating around the center of mass. Look, now this is on the other side. And as <coughs> I complete this rotation, this pink point has also gone around the center of mass of the plate once. And that's the parallel axis theorem. The new moment of inertia is just the old moment of inertia about the center of mass plus md squared, where m is the mass of the plate and d is the distance the plate has gone from the center of the turntable. Now we can calculate the moment of inertia for system A and system B. 
So for system A, we have the two plates in the center of the turntable, and the moment of inertia is the moment of inertia for the turntable plus two times the moment of inertia of a plate around its axis of symmetry. For system B, we also have the moment of inertia for the turntable plus two times the moment of inertia of the plates around its axis of symmetry plus two MD squared from the parallel axis theorem. Plugging in the numbers above, and we find that for system A, it has a moment of inertia of 0 0.895 kilogram meters squared, and for system B, it's 1.4 kilogram meters squared. Since the weight on the ball bearings is the same for both cases, we can assume that the frictional torque stopping both systems is the same. And assuming that they both start at the same speed, it is easy to work out that the ratio of the times should equal the ratio of the moment of inertias. And we see that this is indeed the case. So it's hard to say if both systems actually started with the same speed. So a better way to do this would be to track a point with video analysis and analyze the data with Python. Here is a plot of the x position versus time for configuration A. And you can see that it is well fit by a frequency modulated sine wave. Here are the fit parameters. And the important one is the angular acceleration of negative 0.140 radians per second squared, uh, because that is inversely proportional to the moment of inertia. Similarly for configuration B, it's also well fit by a frequency modulated sine wave with these parameters. And the angular acceleration here is negative 0.0897 radians per second squared. Now, the ratio of the moment of inertias should be the inverse of the ratio of the angular accelerations. And once again, we find that this is the case. Some questions for further inquiry. Um, do these residuals actually indicate a good fit for my data? Why or why not? And how can we get better data? How can we further verify our results? And lastly, why do athletes hold their racket, bat, club, etc. at the end, even though the object is easier to handle when held near their center of gravity? This video was created by me, Jack Hong, with the support of Dr. Marina milner Bolton and the UBC Faculty of Education. I also had help from my sister Anna Hong and my brother Ray Hong in filming, music selection, and video transitions.